The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Oh yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. Okay. All right, so uh, my name is Semi, uh, Semi Chirwal. I, I teach computer science at UNC Asheville, uh, and so I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. I encourage you guys all to come visit Asheville. It's a wonderful place. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about JavaScript, uh, maybe tell you a little bit about my journey from hating JavaScript to uh, loving JavaScript. Uh, before, but before I start, I was just curious, how many of you guys are actually JavaScript programmers? Just a couple of you. How many of you have experience with JavaScript? Um, that, excellent point. Yeah, and that's come, that, that'll, that's important. So we're going to talk about that. Um, but uh, and how, how many of you have had a, any experience with JavaScript? Good. And how many of you love JavaScript? Well, one person. Yeah, the two maybe. Yeah. Okay. So so that's that's kind of why I'm here. I, I, I definitely like talking to um, uh, to giving these talks to like Linux crowd because it tends to be a crowd that generally doesn't like. JavaScript, and, and we'll talk a little bit about why. But before I do, um, if you guys want to, uh, this is some stuff about me. You can find my webpage at semi.me. I'm on Twitter. I'm, I'm, I happily answer tweets. So if you guys uh, want to tweet at me, uh, any questions at, to follow up or anything like that, feel free. I'm also on GitHub, and you'll find all the examples that I'm going to show you already on GitHub, uh, along with a bunch of other no various node things I've done over the over the years, and some some job other JavaScript stuff that you might find interesting. Um, and and this is very shameless self promotion right here. Uh, I'm I'm writing a book for O'Reilly called Learning Web Application De Development. Should be should be out in January if all goes well. So uh, you know if you if you like what I have to say here, much of what I'm going to talk about will be in that book, uh, and hopefully. Uh, uh, you guys might, might enjoy that. It probably won't be as good as Crockford's The Good Parts book, but hopefully it'll be good. Um, OK, so, so let me start with something from the Southeast Linux Fest uh, request for proposals. I, I saw this, and this is when I immediately knew that I had to propose a talk on JavaScript. As you can see, they listed a bunch of areas they were interested in, and it included desktop Linux, GIMP, Inkscape, Ruby, Python, Perl, Java, Security, and Bash. And JavaScript was not in that list. So immediately I was like, oh, wow, this is totally where I have to go and talk about JavaScript. And uh, number four, which is really surprising, is that everybody thinks they're a JavaScript programmer, although you guys seem to be a little bit more realistic about, uh, about what you know about JavaScript. Um, and so, so the reason, these are the reasons I think it's really important that all the tech communities at least have a discussion at some point about JavaScript, that they, they take a look at it, see what it has to offer, and maybe even learn to write good code in JavaScript, because it's not going anywhere. So I, I would actually go a bit further than just saying that Southeast Linux 
best uh, didn't, didn't include JavaScript, but I would say that JavaScript is likely the most maligned language in the history of programming languages. Now that's a strong, bold statement. That's a strong, bold statement. I mean, so has anybody got one that, that they would say is worse? Or they all maligned? I sort of think, too, a, a lot of it comes from misunderstandings, right? Like, I think a lot of people just don't quite understand what JavaScript is as a programming language. And part of that is, is because of its name, right? How many of you have programmed in Java? How many of you, oh, here's, a, here's a question, how many of you have looked at resumes of programmers and have seen somebody write that they know Java slash JavaScript <laughs> as though as though it were one thing, right? You, you, know, you know how I know somebody doesn't know JavaScript? They put Java slash JavaScript on their resume, right? So, so Java and JavaScript are, have, have sort of, the, 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 there's really not a lot in common. I, and I'm, like I mentioned before this talk started, I'm really, really bad on history, so please don't, don't, do, don't fact, check me, check, fact check me on this. But, I, but for what I'm remembering, is that, that JavaScript was originally called LiveScript. It was created by Netscape. And, uh, it, uh, and that Netscape had the, the thought to, they wanted to jump on this Java bandwagon when Java was kind of getting popular. And so they renamed it JavaScript. And I, I think, even, even, I would even go further and say that Netscape uh, got Brendan Eich to change some things about JavaScript so it would be more comfortable for Java programmers. For instance, adding the new operator when you want to create an object, which behaves in a very bizarre way in JavaScript. Uh, so, so yeah, so there's lots of these misunderstandings. Nobody really, or lots of folks who, who really like claim to be JavaScript programmers, like I said, everybody thinks they're a JavaScript programmer, don't really know the language and don't really understand it. They think it's like one of those things that you, uh, uh, one of those things that if you know Java, you can spend a weekend and you're fine in JavaScript. In fact, yesterday I did a search, a Google search for like differences between Java and JavaScript to see how much misinformation I can pull up. And like the first four hits, there was a lie in every single one of those. And one of, the, one of them specifically said JavaScript was an easier language to learn and that something about weekend warriors could easily you know, grasp it without much trouble. And, and that's just not true. I've been doing JavaScript for like three years, probably three solid years now. And there's still things I learned that are new about it that are surprising. Whereas, I, you know, I, Java was one of the first languages I've learned. And I, I don't find Java is quite, quite as, 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 have as many idiosyncrasies as JavaScript has. So there's misunderstandings. Doug Crockford, who I'll talk about again in a second, wrote, wrote this in his book. Nearly all the books about JavaScript are quite awful. Yeah, there's, the, the references for the language are pretty terrible. Um, they contain errors, poor examples, and promote bad practices. So what's that? No, he's not. In fact, he, he, he makes some other exceptions, which I'll tell you about. The other reason, and this is what some, some, somebody else mentioned, is that, um, is that people look at JavaScript as a necessary evil, right? And so because it's everywhere, we all have to sort of deal with it at some point. We have to grapple with this challenging, difficult language. And we come to it with all these biases already built in, like strong typing or, or our thoughts about Java. And then we start hacking away at it. It doesn't take long. I mean, the first thing that you're going to do if you're, if you're trying to write a big program in JavaScript is you're going to do a Google search for how to write classes in JavaScript. right? And if you hit, 
a page that tells you how to write classes in JavaScript and doesn't, doesn't say, hey, JavaScript doesn't actually even have classes. You, you're, you're reading something that's, that's giving, spreading misinformation, right? And so, so once you start coming across this stuff like, oh, well, JavaScript doesn't have classes, so how do we abstract these entities in our program in meaningful ways, you realize you have to learn this entire sort of different way of thinking about programming, and people get frustrated, and then they, they, are, they're, they're, they, they don't like it, right? It's kind of a painful thing. Um, the other thing is, if you've ever, has anybody actually had to maintain somebody else's JavaScript code? That's probably the worst. That's probably the worst thing ever, especially with uh, this kind of, uh, you know, lots of the JavaScript programmers not only came from uh, the, a programming background, but some of them came from a designer background. And they, they, that's the only language that they really know, and they really only know how to do very basic things to make things happen in the web browser with it. Uh, and so you, you, end up, you end up finding yourself, like if you're a programmer and you, you have to actually look at some of this code, it's painful. It really, especially if it gets long, because they don't, un, people don't understand things like functions and, and abstracting things as, as anything like classes. And, and you, you just run into this, this really painful stuff when you have to maintain other people's JavaScript code. Um, and Simon St. Laurent, who works for O'Reilly, wrote in a, in a nice blog post that an involuntary JavaScript creates a tremendous amount of tension around the language. I mean, everybody's got to know a little bit of JavaScript to get by at all now. And it's, uh, and it's painful. It's painful because it's not something that you choose to learn, right? So, so what, what's my history with JavaScript? Well, I, I, um, you know, I, I learned, uh, I don't know, I learned to program when I was very young, and then I, I went to college and got a degree in computer science, and where we focused primarily on Java. Uh, did some C++. We'd like to point out that you are still very young. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. That's, that's very kind of you to say. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I you know, uh, when, so when I was younger, I learned to program. I did some Java. I did some C. I did C plus um, plus. I, I did some Perl at some point, uh, and I, I think that those were the main languages that I had worked with when I when I arrived at uh, JavaScript. And, and really, I was kind of forced into it. I I uh, got a PhD in computer science, and as you know, um, the academic job market was pretty hard several years. Or maybe you don't know, it was pretty hard a few years ago, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to teach. So I started having to find like odd jobs doing things, and one of the things that I started out with was JavaScript because it was people needed it done. And so I, I uh, came into it. I mean, my first JavaScript job was like maybe a total of 48 or 40 hours, um, like straight, uh, not straight, but 40 hours total. Uh, and I had to write this little thing, and I was just like, man, this language is completely awful. This is the worst thing ever, you know. And it's like I was. Uh, this was already beyond like when people were dealing with issues like. Uh, cross-browser compatibility, right? You have to write the, all your code twice. I hear things like people used to have to write things for Netscape once and then Internet Explorer another time. That doesn't happen anymore, but it's still a painful language to write in your first time. So think, time, time went on, I, I, and, and, if, and like probably about a year after I had been doing a little bit of JavaScript, I had to write a... Um, I finally got a job teaching again, and I, I, I had to... I was writing this thing that was accessing the Twitter API on the client. So I was using this thing called JSONP to pull it in for this project that we were working on for, um, to, to create some kind of uh, user interaction with, with, with a presentation. Uh, and, um, and so I, I wrote that code as well. And, and, and I, I sometimes share that code when I give these talks, but I, I was, would be embarrassed to do that now because it's terrible. I wrote that code, and it was terrible, and it was awful, and I felt like that it was, it was you know, that I, I needed to sit, if I was ever going to write any more JavaScript, I had to learn how to do it properly. And so, um, so my next thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to abstract that idea of accessing the Twitter API via JSONP or doing JSONP polling. And I, so I wrote this, this, uh, I wrote this library called Spotter, which is on my GitHub account, that I was going to use in classes to teach kids how to program or, or college kids how to program and using, you know, the Twitter API and things like that. And that I decided I wanted to do the right way. And that's when I really started looking for resources on JavaScript. And of course, there weren't any. And I really hacked it together. And you can look at this code, and you can see that it's, it's not good. It's, it's, it's got lots of problems. But it was around that same time I ran into this book, JavaScript, The Good Parts, by Doug Crockford, uh, which, is, it, which is a really nice book. Uh, it sort of changed my view of the language completely. I highly recommend everybody read that. I think it's, I mean, Everybody's got to deal with JavaScript. If you want to read a good book about JavaScript, that's the one to read. Uh, and 
So I, I learned JavaScript, I, and I, I started studying it. I tried to refactor my code so that it looked better. And as, as time went on, I, I started getting better at it. And then it, maybe a year after that, I got my first job doing Node.js, which was, it was still very early. In, so this was probably two or three years ago. Uh, and I was working with a small startup getting, doing some uh, scaling issues. They, they had this idea that their CTO wanted to try Node for it, and they needed a JavaScript developer, and I had been doing enough of it to where they, I convinced them to hire me, and I, so I started doing Node.js. And uh, after that, um, I, got, I think I got pretty good at JavaScript. I still don't think I'm, I'm like an expert level JavaScript developer, but I, I think I'm pretty good at it, and I, I've been doing it ever since, and I tend to keep getting better at it. Um, so, so I've been doing it for maybe, I guess all in all, that's about five years, um, but really seriously focusing on it for maybe three. Uh, so I've been doing it for a while. Um, and this, I, I wanted to quickly show you some of the books that I found that were good, because like Crockford, who wrote JavaScript, The Good Parts, um, is, uh, wrote that uh, you know, most JavaScript books are bad, but he does say that David Flanagan's JavaScript, The, the Definitive Guide, is fabulous, and it is. It, but it's, it's more of a reference book. Uh, uh, Crockford's book is, is shorter, it's, it's more to the point, it really like, tells you about the good stuff and how you should write good JavaScript code. Uh, last year I read Maintainable JavaScript by uh, Nicholas Zakis, and, and I think he's a former Yahoo employee. Uh, and this is good, uh, somebody mentioned testing, how JavaScript's difficult to test. He talks about testing options with JavaScript. I got a lot out of it. Uh, he, I think he came from Java, so a lot of the tools that he uses in that book are, are former Java tools. Like he uses Ant to automate building. Uh, and stuff like that, which is stuff that I've used as well now, although I'm, I'm moving everything to kind of a node stack. Uh, and then this is a recent book that I haven't read the whole thing. I'm, I'm probably about two-thirds of the way through. Effective <coughs> JavaScript by David Herman is fantastic. It's, um, if you've read Scott Meyer's Effective C++, it's sort, of the, it's, it's sort of the JavaScript version of that. There's like specific tips on things that you should do when you're writing JavaScript code. So I, I highly recommend that you read uh, these books. If, if, if you feel like you want to get good at JavaScript, if you want to, if you want to really uh, get, you know, learn it as a language and not just as like an annoyance. Uh, okay, so so one of the things that Crockford points out, and I think this is really cool, is that, that JavaScript, and it, he's right, it has more in common with Lisp and Scheme. Which are you guys familiar with those languages? Those are functional type languages. They're very very nice. Lots of hackers really like Lisp. Um, and it's, uh, he, he says that it's actually just Lisp and C's clothing. He, in fact, he makes the statement that JavaScript is the first Lambda-based language to, go, to, go, to get popular, to go mainstream, right? Which, which Lambdas, if you're familiar with, are anonymous functions. And that's, somebody mentioned that that's a big annoying thing about JavaScript. Yeah, but that's, if you're a Lisp programmer, you're pretty comfortable with Lambdas. And so that's, that's an interesting thing. So, Doug Crockford also writes a lot about, you know, that if you, if you focus on a subset of JavaScript, like some of the nice things like prototype inheritance and their, the way that they do functions, uh, that you can write good code with it. You just have to leave out some of the bad things like eval, which is a kind of a scary thing in JavaScript, or the with clause uh, and a few other things. And so, but he's very clear about these things. So if you, if you want uh, like, to understand kind of like some of the good things about JavaScript, this is definitely a good book to read. Okay, so, let, let, so, so one of the thing, reasons that JavaScript has come, become more popular now is because of this, this technology called Node.js. And I, I don't know how many of you guys have I, I mentioned it earlier. Somebody said, oh, wow, yeah, Node.js is super hot right now. And it is. It's, it's a really hot technology. Um, and if you don't know much about it, it's built on top of Google's V8 uh, uh, JavaScript interpreter, which is, which is pretty fast. Um, it's event-driven and non-blocking, meaning that when, you, when you're doing something like that's an I/O bound operation, it doesn't hold up the entire CPU until that I/O that I/O operation happens. Like if you request something from a database, for instance, the CPU doesn't pause; it continues on to the next line of code. And I'll show you what I that mean by that in a second. Um, it, it's uh, perfect for data intensive real time applications. I think this is where the the, the sort of the killer application of Node right now is in building real-time applications, doing things with web sockets or, or uh, even, even small devices. I mean, that's one of the things that people are, are really working on now. Um, and so it's, it's really popular. People are using it a lot. Uh, it, it, oh, and I guess the, probably one of the things that I, I, I missed is that it's server-side JavaScript, meaning that it, it's built for making servers. You don't actually 
Uh, it's not something like that runs on top of Apache or anything. It is the server itself. So it's, it's definitely a, a kind of a unique platform. And, I, and you'll see more of that when I start showing you some examples. So I wanted to show you a few things. And I see that this is a little bit hard to see. Sorry about that. Um, but I want to show you a few things before I start going into the examples of, of Node.js that you have to understand about JavaScript to understand some of these things. And the first, the first thing is what somebody already mentioned, is, which is anonymous functions. And this means that um, uh, you, can, you can create a function and not give it a name. And why might we want to do that? Well, if you're sending it as an argument to a, uh, to a f another function that takes in a function parameter, that's something that you might have done in C if you use function pointers. Or, um, or, or other languages. I, I don't think that they are in Java yet, but they might be like in Java 8. But basically, the, the idea here is that like, I'm defining a function called say hello, and console.log is just what the print, the print statement is. So it, uh, this function just uh, says hello world if we call it, which means we put the parentheses after it. And then I can do something called a set timeout, which sort of like queues up an event to happen after so many seconds have passed or milliseconds. So in this case, I did a set timeout on say hello for five, for five seconds. So after five seconds, this, thing will, this program will print, say hello, uh, will print hello world to the screen. Uh, so that's what this, this does. But this is, this is actually equivalent to this code right here, where I just send in the function directly. So I say function uh, console.log hello world as an argument. And this is kind of hard on the eyes, I think, the first time you see it. Um, and that's not just because I didn't make this font big enough, but it's, it's because it's hard on the eyes. Because you're, what is a set timeout? That's a function call, but we're sending in a function, and that's, that's what's happening here. And you'll see this pattern a lot in Node, and you'll see it when I start writing some code for you. Uh, that um, basically, that, that we're, we're using a lot of anonymous functions, so that's important. You may have seen something like this in jQuery, if you've ever done jQuery. Uh, so client-side scripting, this is actually pretty common. But when I started out doing client-side jQuery, I didn't quite understand anonymous functions, and I kind of just ignored a lot of this. And I knew that if I wrote this, th that this is what would happen after the DOM was fully loaded. That's all I really knew. I didn't really register that these things were anonymous functions. So. Uh, so, so anyway, this is an example of jQuery. Uh, the document.ready function is a, is, a, is a function that will allow you to uh, uh, wait till the DOM is fully loaded and then execute any code. And so, but this is an example of an anonymous function in jQuery, which some of you may have seen. Um, asynchronicity is something, uh, or the non-blocking event-driven nature is something you've probably also seen in client-side JavaScript, where, for instance, here's some more jQuery. I attach a function to a, a, a button in this case. So, um, and I should have put a pound or a period, so it was a class or an ID. But input button, I'll, 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 the, the function that is, hand, that is called on the click event is this anonymous function that I send in, and it just prints out button clicked whenever a div with that ID is clicked or class. And then afterwards, I'll do console.log hey there. Now, what happens is that function doesn't actually do anything the first time I call it. It doesn't print out button clicked until somebody clicks on the button. Do you guys see that? Does that make sense? It's an event handler. Here, uh, what you'll see is um, that the hey there will be printed out before anybody can get to the button. Because the, but the event handler is attached, hey there is printed, and then somebody might click on the button, so afterwards. So this, this doesn't necessarily happen in order. right? That's the point, that this doesn't necessarily happen in order. So, uh, so this, is, this is kind of interesting, because when you're dealing with databases in Node, things get kind of, kind of, uh, kind of a little crazy. So for instance, um, let, this is generic code. It doesn't actually do anything. There's, I don't know if there's any database libraries that look like this. But you can look at something like uh, if we have a client to the database called DB client, and we call the query on it. And then as an argument, we send in a query string, like a select star from or something like that. We also, the second argument to this function is a callback, right? That tells it what to do when the, and I'll show you some examples. I'll write some stuff for you like this so you'll see it. But, but it, it tells you what to do when the database actually returns something, OK? So uh, the, the interesting thing is this is just like the button click kind of thing, where this doesn't actually happen until the database returns. So what you'll see is you'll see this line OMG, the DB hasn't responded, printed out before the database actually responds. 
right? So this is where asynchronicity can get kind of weird and kind of difficult to deal with for, uh, and can lead to spaghetti code if you don't know what you're doing. It, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a difficult thing to get used to. Uh, but, but the cool thing about this, so, so you're probably used to doing something like, like you know, uh, D, uh, results equals db.query and then send in the query string and then the next line you use the results. That's what you're used to. The disadvantage of doing something like that in a blocking way is that it blocks. That means the CPU pauses while it's waiting for the database to return its, return its contents to send the results of the query. In this case, though, Node doesn't actually block. It can go on and do other things on the CPU while it's waiting for the, the I.O. to happen. And that's the advantage, or that's, that's the sort of theoretical advantage, is that you can basically queue up all these I.O. operations while still using the CPU to, to, to do things. In the past, we had to do things like multi-threading to, to sort of handle multiple requests at once. But what we'll see is I'll write an echo client that will respond to any number of, uh, uh, or an echo server that will respond to any number of clients without using threads or anything at all. So this is really important in Node. Uh, so, uh, and the last but not least is you'll, we'll see a lot of these things, which are event emitters. Because of this event-driven nature, the event emitter pattern is very, very essential. And this means that we just have these objects that we can attach functions to when certain events happen, right? And so in this case, for, for instance, we'll see hopefully a, an example of, of connecting to the Twitter API. And this is just sending in a function that we're connecting to the Twitter stream API and then uh, we're executing a function whenever a tweet comes across that stream, right? And then everything else can happen while it's just waiting for data to come across the stream, right? So if I, if I look for something like uh, Southeast Linux Fest or a hashtag associated with Southeast Linux Fest, the I.O. The is just waiting for somebody to tweet about that on the stream. It's not blocking. Meanwhile, I can do other things. Uh, and then when a tweet comes across that stream, the, it calls this function. Node calls this function, and it happens. Right? So those are the main ideas. Those are the three or four main ideas that we have to understand to kind of understand some of this code that I'm about to show you. OK, uh, let's see how much time we have. Cool, we have about 30 minutes left. Um, but I'm still a little bit ahead of schedule. Do you guys have any questions before I start showing you code? Are you, I'm sure questions will crop up with, with the code. Yes? What's that? Why should you name an anonymous? So you can give an anonymous function a name like in the, like right here. And uh, you, you might want to do it for like stack trace, like if you have an error. Um, then the error, if it's anonymous, it's just going to say anonymous function. Uh, it won't tell you what it is. And you might want to give it a name so that the stack trace looks, um, so it's a little bit more readable. I think, uh, but, you know, otherwise you might want to do it just to avoid spaghetti code. You might not want to have everything anonymous. Node.js is its own server, but it works in, in, in tandem with the, like, Apache? No. Or, 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 or. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, it can, but, but I'll, I'm going to show you that it, it, it doesn't have to. Right, it doesn't have to. Uh, OK, so let, let me start. Let's start some of these examples, and this is going to be interesting to code. Um, so I've got, I've got all the examples pre-written, so hopefully uh, if I run into problems, we'll, uh, we can fall back to those. Um, I am running. Uh, Vagrant, which is a wrapper for VirtualBox uh, for provisioning a system that has, uh, has uh, Node.js, uh, Redis, and MongoDB all installed by default. So you're welcome. That project's on GitHub if you want to check it out. If you want to get an easy start with Node.js, that's a, that's a good way to do it. Um, I'm going to create a, I'm sorry, go ahead. What's it called again? Uh, so the, Vagrant is the name of the software, but I've got a project on GitHub called Node Dev Bootstrap that, that basically is a set of chef scripts that, bas that provision a Vagrant, or a, vir a virtual box server via Vagrant. All right, so let's see if I can make this work. Uh, whoops, obviously I'm already having problems. Um, I've never actually written code in this sort of uh, way before, but we'll see how it works. Um, no, I think we'll be okay. All right, so um, I'm going to create, uh, a, and we'll just call it x.js, and we'll just sort of hack on this and see if I can get it to work. All right, so let's start out by creating a variable for the network library in Node. So I'm, you'll see that the way you import libraries with Node is just by calling the require function. So var net equals require net. So this means that the entire net library is loaded into the net variable. And then I can say net create server, and let's actually create a variable for the server as well. Oops. Uh, and we will create
create a server. And basically, this will create a raw TCP server for us. Uh, and let's see if this works. And this function is called when a client actually connects to the server. So I'll say hello client. And then I'll make the server listen on port 3000. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run that code. And you'll see XJS is running. And now I'm going to use netcat to connect to it. So it's running on port 3000. And if I do that right, you'll see hello client gets, appears on the server. So it actually has connected. So now what we can do is I can, I can do something with the client now. Um, and what I might want to do, for instance, is write um, on a connection um, to the client. Let's see if this works. So I'll restart the server. And you'll see that the client receives hey there. The server prints out hello, hello client. So, um, so let's do something a little bit slightly more interesting. Let's uh, let's make let's do an echo server. If you're familiar with the echo uh, protocol, basically I send some data from the client to the server, and the server responds with the same data. So what I'll do is when the uh, socket receives some data. So this is uh, let's do this. So this is one of those event emitter examples. So I'll say socket the event that's happening is on data. I will get my data. And let's actually just print out the data when the client sends it along. So I will do a console.log data.toString. And this basically is going to print to the console the, uh, what's connected. Uh, we'll do, um, so let's, let's run this again. And this time I'm going to say hello. And you'll see it prints out hello in the new line in the server. All right, pretty exciting stuff. So now all we want to do is we want to uh, send it back. So I'll do a uh, uh, socket.write data. And let's see what happens. And, whoops. and if you're on your computer and you know my IP address, I think you can connect to this and as long as you don't. I guess I can't control whether you write anything offensive. But uh, Oh, they can't? OK. All right, well, uh, let's see what. Uh, uh, oh, no, it's, it's forwarding the port from my IP address, though. So, so they were able to connect to the HTTP server I set up earlier. So hopefully this, uh, it doesn't matter, because we're going to move on to HTTP. It'll be more interesting anyway. Let's see if this actually works. OK, so um, uh, let's uh, NC localhost. I'm going to send hey there. And you'll see I got hey there back. Echo. All right, so, the, so, so what it's doing is it's just doing an echo server, right? And people are connecting, it looks like. Uh, and so, um, so, so the interesting thing about how many of you guys have written an echo server in C or Java? Yeah, if you've taken a network class, I think it's like the first exercise. It's hard. Um, and, and the reason is because of the blocking nature of C or Java. Uh, if you write an echo server in C, once a client is connected, that program is not going to respond to any other clients. Does that make sense? It's blocked until, it, until, it, it, uh, until uh, that client disconnects and another client can connect. So what about Node? What's happening with Node? Well, uh, it's, oh, so how do we solve that problem in C? Fork. Fork. You can create, either create a new process, or you can do multi POSIX threads if you want. I mean, that's probably a, 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 a better solution, I would say. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. That's arguable, I guess. But I, I would definitely say that threading is a common thing to crop up. And you have to then, when you're dealing with threading, you're dealing with locks, you're de dealing with shared memory, things get really messy. This is all the code that we're dealing with right here. And this will connect to as many clients as your CPU will handle, right? Because it creates a new responder for each one that connects. And, and it just basically queues up the request. While, while one person is not sending stuff over the pipe, it can respond to others. Right, so this, this, if you've written a C echo client uh, or echo client server thing, I, I mean, if you haven't, I recommend you do it. It's pretty fun. But, uh, but it's hard. With Node, it's, it's a breeze. It's really simple. Right? So if that's not exciting for you, we're going to move on to something that might be a little bit more exciting. All right, so 
All right, so we've got this net, uh, net thing. What happens if we want to do something more complicated than just dealing with raw TCP stuff, and which Node really does that. I mean, you can write any kind of server program that you've written in your classic systems languages you can write in Node because it just handles raw TCP clients. Um, so, so what we're probably mostly here for is because we're interested in web stuff. And what's the protocol that we use for the web? HTTP, HTTP right? And we don't want to write an entire HTTP server. Fortunately, HTTP um, comes built into Node. So instead of using net, I can use HTTP. And let's go ahead and just delete all this. Um, and, and so I've got the HTTP library. I've got server. I'm going to do a server equals HTTP.createServer. Uh, and the server, the function that gets called when somebody connects to an HTTP server bring, takes in two arguments, a request and a response. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set the uh, header for the HTTP response to uh, content type um, text HTML. So we're going to send back some HTML. And then I'm going to uh, go ahead and just write a string and end this, this session with HTTP, right? So um, I'll write p hello world. And we're going to listen again on port 3000, which is not normal for HTTP, but it'll work for this example. And we'll do node xjs. Hopefully, I won't get any errors. OK, so now I can use um, something like curl. Um, whoops. So let's see if I do curl localhost 3000. If you're familiar with dealing with HTTP from the command line, I can do a curl localhost 3000 and get back to hello world. Um, and likewise, uh, I can open up my browser, and you'll see Hello World is being sent to the browser. So I've got an HTTP server now created. Pretty cool, huh? OK. All right, you guys are a tough crowd. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you'd be going nuts on the, uh, I thought you'd be going nuts on the Echo server client thing. I mean, I thought there would be like, people would be standing up and sh shaking their arms. All right, so, uh, so let's, uh, Let's, get, let's see if we can do something a little bit cooler. Uh, so let's, um, let's keep track of the number of times the server's been hit. So I'll just create a new variable to keep track of. And this way, we can start letting people access this. Um, I'll just create a variable called num hits, set it to 0. Uh, and then every time somebody connects, uh, I'll just increment num hits. If you're comfortable with the plus plus, it just takes what's in num hits, adds ones to adds one to it. Uh, and then before I send the hello world, I'll write out um, the server has been hit plus um, num hits times. Uh, and let's put an ending paragraph tag there. Then let's see if this uh, this works. Um, and we'll go back. It's been hit one time, again three times. Now, if anybody else wants to hit my server, uh, my uh, let's see what my IP address is. It's uh, 172.16.33.145 colon 3000. And uh, we'll see if anybody's hit it. Well, no, nobody's hit it yet. Um, why is it incrementing by two every time? Do you guys know? This yeah, is a puzzle is for right me. And a return. No. 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 There's this thing that, that the web browser, it took me forever to figure this out. I feel, I feel like an idiot. But there's this thing the web browser will do, which is uh, it'll request something called a fav icon, which is this little thing that you see right here. <laughs> and my, it actually is doing the request, and my, my, my server is responding to that. And so um, you can see that it increments by two. If I use curl, curl doesn't request the fav icon, so it'll go up by one. Um, but you know, we, can, we can sit here all day and watch that this is keeping track. But the cool thing about this, again, this is an HTTP server. It's not using any threads. It will respond to all of us, like right. So everybody can connect in here, and it's going to respond. It's going to keep track of the number of times that things can hit. You don't have critical sections though, because it's not, it, there's no um, there, there's no locks or anything. That, there's no shared memory. It's like the cool thing about it is that uh, it's just queuing up segments of code, right? There's no there's no uh, interrupts happening, right? Uh, so it's just queuing up the request if somebody else is being responded in the next CPU cycle that's available, it sends it. Now, if I did something like computed the 20th Fibonacci number 
in the middle of these requests, then you start to see some slowdown because calculating the Fibonacci sequence is a CPU bound process. But what is this process? This process where we're waiting for somebody to request something from the server is an I.O. bound process. So that's what Node's good for. Node's not good for CPU related stuff, right? But, but fortunately, if you're a web programmer, most of what you're doing is I.O. bound anyway, right? OK, so let's try to do something a little bit more interesting. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> let's see if I can. Uh, sure. Uh, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, so I think I can actually. Um, I don't know. Let's see if it, I think it'll just format it as JSON. That's a really good. That's a really good idea. Let's see if we can see. Oops. Uh, let's see if this works. Oh no! All right. Well, let's do. Let's do this. Um, yeah. Let's call. T, let's call two string on it. Uh, yeah, you took me off script. I'm now I'm going to be. Now no, nothing's going to work from here on out, right? I, di I didn't practice this. Oh no, it's not working. Yeah, but you can. I, here's here's what I can do though. Like, I, if you want to see it, I can print it to console instead. So I can just say um, console. So you can see the request object if I just print it out to console, and and then we'll do a request, and this is what it looks like. So you get you get lots of information from the request. Um, yeah, you can pull out the actual query and everything that you want, but let, let's move on because hopefully this is going to get more interesting. Uh, at least, at least if I, as I start to really uh, hit a wall in terms of what I can do live, it'll get interesting. Okay, so um, so the next thing I want to do is I want to connect to the Twitter API, um, and w the reason that I want to do this, I want to show you kind of this like ability of Node to do this um, multiplexing thing because. Uh, it's going to be handling the Twitter stream while responding to HTTP requests at the same time. And this is where, when you deal with Node, it starts to feel like you're playing with Legos. I, I, this is the, my experience with it. I, I've started to feel like whenever I'm doing stuff in Node, I, I start to feel like I'm just playing with Legos and prototyping stuff out very quickly. I'm going to put all this stuff in the same file. Obviously, I don't write production code like this. But, but, it, but you'll see that I'm just going to start adding pieces and, and seeing what happens. OK. So next, I'm going to uh, call in this module called nTwitter, which is uh, the no one of the, this is not a built in to the node. This isn't built into the Node API, but um, it is installable via npm, which is the Node package manager. So you can just do npm install nTwitter and get it installed locally. Um, and to do this, I need to pull in. Um, I actually have some credentials. Uh, ooh, uh, hang on a second. Let's, uh, so this is what I need to send in to create my Twitter client. Um, and I'm not going to show those since this is on video, but I'll create Twitter equals new in Twitter. And so this will be consume, uh, credentials dot consumer key. And this is going to be really fun for you guys to watch. Credentials.consumer secret. Uh, credentials. And if, if I misspell something, please call me on it. Dot access token key. And whoops. Credentials.access token secret. OK. And I need to call in the credentials file, which is in one subdirectory up. So I'll require uh, credentials.js. OK. So hopefully this, uh, so I can just pull in that file, because it's an it's a NPM module. And there's an example file. You can go, if you want to play with this stuff, you can go on to Twitter, dev.twitter.com, and create your own credentials. And it, let me make sure I don't have any errors. No errors yet. OK. So I've got, hopefully I've connected to Twitter. And then what I'll do is I'll call stream, and we're going to use the filter stream. Uh, and we're going to tell it what to track. And in this case, I'm going to track just the word awesome. So this is just the JSON object. And feel free to ask questions as I'm doing this. I don't mind. Um, and when then this anonymous function is called the stream function. Uh, I'm sorry, this anonymous function is called with the stream object that gets created. 
And so now I can do stream. Let's, let's go ahead and check for an error condition to make sure that this is going to work. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll go to the old code. OMG error. And now, hopefully, this is where the magic will happen. The stream will send data through. I'll get a tweet back. And what we'll do is we'll just log the text of the tweet. So basically, this is just going to be um, the, whatever the actual tweet. The tweet object's big. It's got a bunch of stuff in it, and we'll just handle that. So let's see if this works. Um, it'll be a miracle if it does. It's very slow. Nothing's happening. All right, so let's see. Um, what did I forget? Let's make sure this is happening. That's right. This is, uh, yeah, this is how you debug on the fly. So this is actually getting called. Um, so the stream is getting called. So, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. I think, I think, um, I think this has to be an array of things, maybe. But it should give me an error then. Nothing. OK, so let's do this. Let's go back up to the example above, and we'll run it from here. Uh, that's not good. It was working as, oh, you know what might have happened? Let's see. My network is down. So let me, um, let me first of all, um, restart networking on this. See if the, it might have disconnected. Let's see if this changes. OK. All right. Whoops. Still nothing. Oh, man. Let's see if this changes anything. Darn. But I'm not getting anything from Google anymore. So what that means is that I guess we're not going to be able Let me try it one more time to um, do a, a, let's see, whoops. Uh, networking, restart. OK, let's see if I can connect to Google now. Yeah. So I'm not even, oh, wait, there we go. That's pretty slow. Um, let's, let's do this. Let's try to reconnect on the host. Whoa, OK. Let's see if it'll. Should have used the. Does anybody? Well, I guess I can't ask out loud if anybody has a password for the vendor. <laughs> the vendor. One. Let's see if this changes anything. All right. Um, let's uh, let's restart networking. Ping Google. All right. That's a little bit faster. So let's see if now node HTTP Twitter. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is actually working. Let's actually see if my my real code that I wrote in front of you is working too. Um, yeah, OK, cool. So, so what I did, all right, so let's look at the code again and see what's happening, is I, I basically wrote a, a Twitter stream handler right, right above my server. And the cool thing about this is that this thing, while it's responding to the Twitter stream, you'll see and it's looking for anything that's got the word awesome in it, uh, it is actually still responding to HTTP requests. So in those little pauses between when a tweet's coming in and the, uh, and the request happens, it's responding to HTTP requests. So we can all connect to this. And in fact, I can keep track of the number of, um, I can keep track of the number of tweets that we've seen by just adding an additional thing and sending that as an HTTP response. Right? Does that make sense? Pretty cool, huh? OK, so let me, go, let me go to the next example since I'm going to quickly run out of time. And I want to give you guys a chance to look at some, um, to ask questions. So um, let's look at Redis. So are you guys familiar with Redis? Redis is a key value store. In this case, what, I, what I've added here, and you'll see this is exactly the same code. The difference is I've imported the Redis module here. Um, and I've created a Redis client. So it's a key value store. You can think of it as a kind of a database of sorts. Uh, and it's going to keep track of, I'm going to track multiple words and keep track of the number of times each of those words have been seen in the Twitter stream. 
So in this case, you see the words I'm looking for are awesome, cool, rad, gnarly, and groovy. Uh, and um, you guys uh, use the word gnarly or groovy? Gnarly. 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 I know, I know. It's like, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we'll see what Twitter thinks of this. What, 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 what happens here is that we've set up the track array, and you'll see that I've, I've changed this now. So instead of just sending in the, or awesome, the word awesome, I'm sending in the word words. Um, and I am, uh, basically, when I get one in, I'm, I'm just incrementing the key associated with that word in Redis. If you're not familiar with Redis, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's really cool. It's really easy to use. Uh, and then I create the server, and the server is actually now writing back each of the word counts. It's, call, it's calling into Redis, uh, which you can see here. I'm getting the things out of Redis and when the HTTP request happens, and then I'm writing those to the document. And you can look at this code in detail later. And let's see if this works. Um, oh. Redis is not on service, or it, it, no, there are there are service providers for it, but it's just a local data key value store um, that's running now. So let's run Redis and see if that changes. Uh, it's not. It's stored in memory, but you can make it persistent. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if that. I don't know if I was printing it out, but let's see. And you'll see that the internet has failed me again. Um, let's let's go ahead and try that again. Let's do the same thing we did before. And let's kill this. Oh, let's wait till it connects. Okay. Let's see if this lets me work. Okay, so now you're seeing that I've got, I've seen eight tweets with cool, one tweet with rad, none with gnarly. Still keeping track of the number of tweets we've seen and the number of times the server's been hit. Oh, check it out. 96 awesome, cool. One gnarly. Yeah, yeah, one gnarly. No one gnarly, no groovies. <laughs> um, you can see, <laughs> I can, I'm keeping track of all these. So, what's that? Yeah, yeah. So I can, um, so I, I can keep track of that. Now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was that Node was really, and you see that it's now it's crashed out again. Uh, one of the things that, that Node's really good at is uh, real-time stuff. And there's another Lego part that we can add to our code uh, <laughs> called Socket IO, and that's a, an abstraction for uh, that's an abstraction for web sockets. So it'll work even if the web browser doesn't support web sockets or the web server or the browser or anything, which is kind of cool. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run um, this one, and let's see if this actually works. And now you actually see I'm updating in real time, and it's just and it's only one little bit. Actually, the code for the Socket IO version is smaller than the code for the Redis version because I've I've delivered the index.html file as a separate file as well. So it, and so there wasn't much code added. I'll show you. And it, it, the internet's obviously. Wait, wait, is there a Groovy yet? There is still no Groovy. If yeah. somebody wants to tweet Groovy, we should see a response. Um, but let's, so let me show you the code for this real quick. Uh, oops, sock, it, I, S, sock it, dot JS. The main code for the entire, the entire code for this, the server side code is right here, right? This is all that's happening. When it, when it connects, it sends the list of words over. And then every time one gets updated, it pushes to the browser the new value. So it's that, it's, it's that, uh, that cool. So if anybody's tweeted Groovy, now we've got two Groovies. So somebody tweeted it, thank you, I, I mean, presumably, because um, we're pretty sure that nobody else on the planet is tweeting Groovy right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is happening in real time. Okay. So this is actually pulling data from Twitter and it's it, like as it's happening and it's posting. So um, if people are tweeting Groovy right now, it's actually, this is actually what you're doing. Statuses.filter returns all of the, I, in most cases, will return all of the tweets that are associated with that word, uh, whereas the only other thing you can do is just sample the tweets. Um, that's not true if you start pulling tweets about like Bieber or Obama. Oh, we, we, so my students were, we were doing some research on, um, tracking political sentiment up to the election. And so we were searching for all the tweets with Obama and Romney and love and hate in them. And so, um, so that, that's, and, and we were missing some in that case. But filter for things like awesome and groovy and gnarly, we'll get them all. In fact, if I put self in there, we'll probably get some of those too. So let me, um, uh, actually, what is the, what's, it's self2013 is the hashtag, right? So um, let's see if I can put that in there and run this again. 
I, I could, I'd be glad to answer questions now. I, I realize I didn't give you guys a ton of time, but go ahead. It's part of what I can answer. This is, this no, no, is it's happening on the server side. The server's listening to the tweet and the tweet yeah. into the uh, That's That's right. Okay. Let me reload. And how much access do I have to, say, file system and... Everything. Um, yeah, so, so uh, Node has a file system module. And in fact, if you look at the code for this, you can see how I pulled in uh, the HTML file. I actually used read stream, so I streamed. So if you, if you like Linux, you know, you like pipes, hopefully. Like, I don't mean like smoking pipes, I mean like pipes. <laughs> you might like those two. Uh, but but, but pi pipes, like, so you can pipe streams to each other, and that's what I do in the example here with, um, with the socket example. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so what's happening here is, is you'll see an example of this. I'm just, yeah, I'm creating a read stream on this file, uh, index.html, which comes out of the file system module, and then I just pipe that to the response. So it's just pulling it in and then piping it directly into the response, the HTTP response. Um, let's see if I got any self-tweets. I don't, I don't think it was working. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what's going on. Uh, well, you didn't have a way to split it. I did, I think. Uh, let's try it one more time and then. No, I probably didn't do that. <laughs> no, I think I saved it. No, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I, I think it's like maybe caching the response. Or I, I don't know. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, 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 yeah. It's the way I'm including it in jQuery. It doesn't like the, it doesn't like the hashtag. Oh, OK, so hang on. Yeah, so that's the problem. Let's see if I can fix that real quick. and. Um, So keep asking questions, y'all. Um, I think this is I think this launch after this, so maybe. Um, oh, there we go. No. So if you tweet about self 2013, maybe we'll get something in here. Um, anyway, uh, questions? Yeah, yeah. What do, you, what do you guys want to talk about? Yep. Okay, theoretical here, um, but um, do you see this uh, 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 Node or JavaScript, uh, either one, being uh, deprecated by HTML5 or being enhanced by it? Enhanced, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, JavaScript's definitely enhanced by HTML5. I think it, in, in the relationship's got, gotten a little stronger for various reasons. But um, I, I mean, the, the big competitor to JavaScript right now is going to be Dart, I think. Uh, I, I have my doubts that it's going to, which is Google's plat, uh, client side platform. I have my doubts that it'll, it'll take, make, take JavaScript out of the equation altogether, but it, it'll definitely be an alternative. And I don't know if you guys know this, but JavaScript is now like a compile target. So there's languages like CoffeeScript uh, and Processing JS, which is one I use a lot, and uh, ClojureScript. Uh, and if you keep up with what Mozilla is doing with ASMJS, which is pretty freaking incredible if you haven't seen this, they've got this subset of JavaScript that they're compiling C++ code to. Um, it sounds bad, but they've got. It took them five days, I think, to port the Unreal Tournament engine to run completely in the browser. Uh, so JavaScript is a compile target now, which is pretty, which is pretty awesome, and that saves some of us who, who, no matter how much we read about JavaScript, we still aren't going to like it. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it, the fact that it's a compile target now it leads people to say things like JavaScript is the assembly language of the web. Um, so it's not going anywhere, I don't think. There's been too much t money and time spent on optimizing it. But, but if you hate it, there's at least going to be some alternatives down the road. Yes. Oh, cool. That's fantastic. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and I, I mean, I also know that Red Hat's doing stuff with JavaScript. I mean, they're, uh, I, I know somebody that works at Red Hat that's working on a Node.js compatible API that runs on top of Dyn.js. Uh, so yeah, uh, so it's, it's, there's, Linux is sort of, in, I, I mean, JavaScript isn't everything, right? Like, I mean, Microsoft is supporting JavaScript on uh, Azure now, so no matter where you go, you're probably going to have to deal with JavaScript at some point, which is uh, either, you can either be happy about it or you can be bummed about it, you know? Yeah. Who really controls the language now? ECMAScript. So um, the ECMA, it's a, it's a standards body. I think there are people from Mozilla on it and probably other other organizations. I don't know the details, but it's a separate, it's a separate organization, fortunately. Yeah, it previously was just Netscape, but the ECMAScript, ECMAScript made it a standard. 
What else? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, so this has been the stuff I've been showing today is pretty low level. Um, there's the Express framework. If you're, if anybody is, are there any Ruby developers? Uh, Sinatra is a really cool Ruby framework that's a lighter weight than Rails and less opinionated. Express is a uh, Express is a, a uh, um, is the uh, is the Node equivalent of of Sinatra. Uh, or it's actually better than Sinatra now. I, I like Express a lot. And last weekend we did the um, we did the Civic Day of Civic Hacking in Asheville, and uh, we used Express and Twilio to build out an application in like I don't know five or six hours, where people could text and then it would filter the text into a web page, and it was it was nothing. It was really easy. So you can do high level stuff with Node, um, uh, but the low level stuff is is sort of I, I think in some ways is, is sort of I don't know. A lot of people don't know about this, like that you can write raw TCP servers in Node very easily, uh, and they're, they're already multiplexing and you handle multiple requests and stuff like that. And you don't have to deal with the issue of uh, threads and shared memory, which is problematic if you've ever had to do it. Yes. Right. Right. No, yeah, Node is popular. No, I mean, it's being used, like, uh, uh, you look at the job ads, and Netflix is hiring Node programmers. Um, like, all the big companies are. Yammer was an early supporter. They've got, um, uh, I've got one minute left. They've got, like, uh, Getty, which is, the, um, which is sort of like the rails of Node.js. Uh, but but the, it's very, the thing about Node is it's very easy to write modules. Like I showed you, that's like Lego building blocks, and you can, you can just sort of build them really easily, and then so there's so if they, that's the other thing I probably should have mentioned is a lot of the Node.js developers and the core team follow the Unix philosophy, have a lot of very very small programs that do one thing very very well, and that's like in Twitter for instance, and so that's 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 a big part of the Node community, and it grew out of obviously Unix, and so it should be something that, that that's very familiar to a lot of you. But I have to stop now because we're, we're done, but I'm glad to hang around. I've got nowhere to be, uh, so if you guys want to talk for a little bit, I, I can talk more, but thank you. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. 
Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, 
It's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CogStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked.